Greetings and salutations, friends, and welcome back to more Warhammer 40k lore, where today we are returning to Krieg to talk about the single most important export of that war world. For it is not the millions of artillery pieces, the billions of men, or the trillions of las weapons and power packs. It is one element of the Death Corps siege armies that allow them to do what they do so damned well. The Death Corps Engineers. Without them, nothing would even get started. They are the workhorses of any siege effort. They dig the trenches, the sapper tunnels, the communication lines, the logistical networks, the gun pits, supply dumps, reinforced fuel stores, troop shelters, and command bunkers. On Vrax, they began digging these installations kilometers outside of the defender's gun range. And then, little by little, meter by meter, they extended the trenches, the communications lines, the bunkers, the storage depots, everything for miles upon miles upon miles to surround the Cardinal City. And trenches, mind you, is so much more than a simple lines cut into the dirt. They are works of architectural and engineering genius that must constantly turn and swivel and break and bend every few meters to ensure that the enemy cannot fire their weapons down the length of the trench lines, to ensure that one lucky shell only wipes out a couple meters of a defensive line rather than dozens. And it's not a matter simply of digging a hole and then expanding it either. The trenches need continuous reinforcements all along the entire length of it to ensure that they cannot simply collapse due to a near hit, to ensure that weather patterns like rain, for example, doesn't wash away weeks of work in mere hours. And in certain circumstances, like on Vrax, where huge quantities of chemical weaponry was also deployed by both sides, you need drainage systems to ensure that the trenches don't simply turn into poisonous swamps. And even then, the trenches are probably the simplest part of the gargantuan construction effort that is a modern-day siege against the fortress in the 41st millennium. Let us take, for example, something simple, right? A dugout, a place to shelter men during enemy artillery bombardments or to keep them ready and secure until the order is given to attack across no man's land. Firstly, you are going to have to dig a big ass hole in the ground, large enough to accommodate several squads of Death Corps soldiers with all of their equipment and various baggage. You're going to have to do this whilst under fire from the enemy and constant harassing artillery bombardments. Then, you are going to need to emplace a structure capable of surviving anything but a direct hit by heavy siege artillery, which is usually going to mean reinforced concrete emplacements. All of this concrete needs to be transported to the front line again whilst under enemy fire. Wood <laughs> basically didn't exist on Vrax, so concrete would be damn near the only option, and the only safe one as well. Then, once this massive bunker has been set in place, you need to cover it with dirt, once again under continuous fire. Now, you need to install all of the various commodities and amenities you are going to require inside of the dugout. You will need a filtration system to keep out poisonous gas and various corrosive weapons. You will need water supplies, food, and possibly ammunition as well, as you have no idea how long the enemy's barrage might last, and a group of soldiers exhausted due to lack of food or water are going to prove a rather ineffective assaulting force. 
You are also going to need to install communication equipment, so as to keep the various commanders and officers up to date about the situation outside of their dugout, when to leave, when to prepare to assault across no man's land, when to leave the bunkers even under heavy artillery bombardment because the enemy is charging your positions, etc, etc. You will not be able to use short form radio because that will be blasted off the roof of your bunker immediately. The only option will be to dig yet further smaller trenches into which hardline communication wires can be laid and protected from the outside bombardment, and this will have to go from dugout to dugout to bunker to bunker and so on. And this is just one dugout. Then you've got all of the actual proper bunkers, the emplacements for heavy weapons, heavy bolters, auto cannons, rocket launchers, las cannons, emplacement for tanks, emplacements for anti-air guns, for the artillery itself, which is another major headache because an artillery gun does not require one dugout. An artillery gun is going to require multiple dugouts, maybe as many as three or four or five per weapon, so that the gun can be moved from one dugout to another so as to interfere with the enemy's ability to effectively target your own artillery. Not to get started even on the need to supply all of these guns with artillery shells, ridiculously heavy artillery shells that need to be emplaced meters upon meters below ground in reinforced and armored storages unless you want to see both the gun and the three nearby emplacements be wiped out by an enormous underground detonation due to a lucky enemy strike. And speaking of self-propelled artillery, there are other heavy tracked things that need moving as well. Tanks or large troop carriers like the Gorgons. These are massive things and very heavy as well. How do you think they can move through an entire defensive trench line to get ready to assault the enemy trench lines? The answer of course is another few metric tons of engineer blood, sweat and tears. As specialized approaches need to be laid out to facilitate the movement of these vehicles. You can't simply have a dirt road that is only used by tanks, because by the time the first dozen armored vehicles will have traveled down that way, there will be nothing but churned up and destroyed mud in their wake. And so if you are going to be moving hundreds of armored vehicles, you are going to have to put down permacrete to support them. If you're going to put down permacrete, you are either going to have to continuously repair them due to the enemy bombardments, or you are going to have to dig, that's right, yet more massive ass trenches. Maybe even straight up tunnels with reinforced permacrete coverings so that you can drive entire armored regiments down them and to the front line. Where of course, the tanks are also going to require defensive positions. They need dugouts so they can go hull down and minimize the risk of the vehicles getting destroyed before the attack even begins. Then they are going to need ramps leading up and out into no man's land so that they can deploy properly. And again, bearing in mind the damage that even a single one of these vehicles will do to such a ramp, you are going to need several. And to make sure that the enemy cannot use your own ramps against you, they are likely going to have to be constructed specifically for that one operation, that one offensive, and then destroyed later. And on the note of building only to destroy it, what do you think happens when the front actually moves? That's right, all of this will have to be done again and again and again. I trust I've made the point that uh, a trench line, a siege line, is a lot more than a simple line in the dirt. And of course, we haven't even gotten to the offensive duties of Death Corps engineers yet. Though, 
before we get to that, I want to take a little sidetrack from this lovely archaeological discussion that we are having here and discuss the Death Corps of Krieg engineers, their training, their equipment, and what makes them so very different from the regular infantry squads. Beyond their penchants for digging, that is. Because, mind you as well, the engineers are the ones that are going to be doing most of the reinforcing. The forward digging, the construction, and the higher level stuff. Whereas the soldiers will probably be doing most of the actual trench line digging. They're the ones making the holes, the engineers are the ones making sure that they're not going to be collapsing immediately which can be easier said than done in certain circumstances. And so, to ensure this, the engineers are carrying with them a considerable quantity of specialised equipment, a lot of which would probably be immediately recognisable to any civilian engineer as well. Ground auspexes, for example, to take readings of the style of dirt they're dealing with, the depth of the dirt, when rock can be expected, whether it is porous, how it absorbs liquid, how it may react to being dug out, etc, etc. It may all sound like pointless pedantry, but, well, try to dig a trench line through sand, for example, and one through mud, and one through just solid dirt. It's going to require different approaches each and every time. They're going to require different equipment and different reinforcements. Certain types of soil might even make digging damn near impossible, or so time-consuming to do and continuously re-dig, rebuild and repair as to be an almost complete waste of time. Not that that would make the Death Court give up, mind you, it simply means that they would have to make full-on permacrete trenches instead. It's going to take ten times as long, but if there is one thing the Death Court always has, it is time. But perhaps the worst nightmare for any soldier or Death Corps engineer asked to dig is nice, heavy, rocky ground, particularly with frequent protrusions of massive ground rock. It's always fun. In these scenarios, the Death Corps employ another favourite tool of the engineer, big, fat wads of high explosives. And really, you would be surprised just how flexible and, when handled correctly, precise a tool TNT can be. For example, the liberal application of debt packs can turn flat ground into a dugout in 0.3 seconds. And that massive, bothersome boulder sitting right in the way of the new command bunker to pebbles in even less. But tragically, sometimes more subtle means are required. In which case, out comes the trusty folding shovel. Standard equipment for every Death Corps soldier, virtually regardless of rank and or position. The engineers would also have access to other digging and mining equipment. Jackhammers, pickaxes, drills, all of these sorts of things. But eventually, the digging and the building will all be done. And at that point, the engineers will transition from construction duty to offensive duty. Where the engineers are trained and equipped to perform just as well as any elite grenadier squad, albeit with a more specialised approach. The first and clearest sign of this specialisation is the standard weapon issued to each and every engineer, not the LAS rifle made so famous by the men above, but rather the Lucius Patton Mark 22C Combat Shotgun. This is an 8 rounds semi-automatic high gauge weapon capable of firing multiple types of ammunition, including armor-piercing slugs, shot for anti-infantry duty, and flares. 
above ground, the Mark 22 would almost certainly be little more than a liability, as it has an enormous recoil, dreadful accuracy, and relatively short range. But underground, in a tunnel, <laughs> none of those things matter. A damned thing. And what you want is the ability to kill whoever is in front of you with one shot and preferably his buddy behind him as well. And for that job, there are very few guns capable of being carried by a man that are better than the Mark 22. As even an ogre caught in front of this is going to have a damn hard time staying upright with a watermelon-sized hole blown clear through him. But the downside with using a shotgun, of course, is that if you are in a position to shoot the enemy, odds are pretty good they're in a position to shoot you as well. And whilst the Death Corps engineers wear more in the way of armour than the regular soldiers, as they are equipped with the carapace armour of the Grenadiers, plus shoulder guards and extra abdominal plating, if you can help it, you'd usually rather not get shot. The nature of tunnel fighting, however, makes this best case scenario occasionally somewhat difficult to achieve, though. Where there is a problem, there's always a solution, and in this scenario, it's once again explosives, as the engineer squads are equipped on average with a lot more in the terms of frag and crack grenades than the regular assault squad. And whilst the boys up top would usually prefer fragmentation grenades due to their larger kill radius, below ground it's all about the crack grenades. For whilst the fragmentations from the frag would usually provide a larger kill zone, in the cramped, closed off and confined quarters of tunnel fighting, you want sheer explosive force, as the overpressure and the fact that it's got nowhere to go but up and down the tunnel makes crack grenades much more lethal. But ideally, an underground encounter is over before either side has even gotten to pull a single trigger or throw a single grenade as there is a weapon far more lethal than either, information. Tunnel fighting is a constant cat and mouse game, with the offense digging tunnels referred to as saps under no man's land and into the enemy's lines. This is either to create a direct approach that will be blasted open and then an assault will be pushed straight through the tunnel and into the enemy's lines, a difficult and very dangerous approach but also potentially very rewarding, or alternatively, the sap will be built under the enemy's trench lines and a mine will be placed. In this case, mine refers to an enormous quantity of yet more high explosives. You're starting to see a theme here, aren't you? In fact, we've tried this in the real world as well. Now, the process of sapping and undermining enemy defences is absolutely ancient. We've been doing it since, well, literally the ancient time, but perhaps the most famous example of a mine comes from the First World War, where the British detonated 43,400 kilograms of high explosives, or 95,000 pounds, underneath the German lines. When the bomb was detonated, it created a hole 76 meters or 250 feet deep and 12 meters or 40 foot wide. Big boom. And a very good way to clear out a large section of the enemy's defense line. But before you can get to that point, you need to dig the sap, a very, very long tunnel, whilst constantly the enemy is trying to counter-sap your tunnels. 
as the only good way to deal with them is to find the tunnel and then break into it, killing the crew and then collapsing the tunnel with another big old bundle of high explosives. Meanwhile, the offensive side is also digging their own countermines to stop the enemy from countermining their countermines, which will be countermined in turn by the enemy's counter countermines, and so on. Now, finding a mine is, um, not all that easy, as even ground-penetrating auspexes only have a range of a handful of meters. You can't simply point one of these towards the ground and see everything. Your best indication of anything going on is more often than not sound and or vibrations, which are a little bit easier to pick up, but still fairly difficult to get anything conclusive out of it. Once an enemy mine has been detected, however, assault teams will be brought up in the countermine and it will be breached either via a number of melter charges placed in such a way as to create a large hole directly into the enemy mine. Once this is done, the assaulting forces will then rush in, throwing hand grenades and firing shotguns to clear out any dazed defenders, then set their own charges to collapse the mine as deep as possible before withdrawing. Alternatively, the Imperials on Vrax in particular had a massive advantage over the local defenders in that they had access to a weapon known as the Mole Launcher. This is a device that fires a warhead with a highly advanced boring tip allowing it to dig its way through rock and dirt whilst also being remotely controlled by a Death Corps engineer. He will steer the weapon towards the enemy's tunnel, and once he's broken into it, will detonate the warhead. And the explosion is usually more than big enough to collapse the tunnel at the very least locally. It won't be as complete a destruction as a full raid planting demolition charges up and down the length of the tunnel, but as a quick fix to an enemy tunnel before they have a chance to either flee it or begin their own attacking operations, it is a fantastic tool which increase the death rate of the enemy considerably. And speaking of Vrax again, there's another lovely example. Of course, if for some mysterious reason you haven't watched the Siege of Vrax series yet, do it. God damn it, just do it. I know people who's rewatched it no less than five times, so surely you can give it at least once, right? I guarantee the quality. But the engineers might also take part in much larger underground operations. I mentioned previously the idea of digging a tunnel to break into the enemy's trenches. Usually this is a raiding tactic rather than a full out offensive due to the fact that a tunnel can only support so many men. You are likely to have the soldiers stretched out in single or maybe if you're very lucky double file meaning that the number of soldiers you can pour into the enemy trench per minute is very limited, particularly when compared to the enemy's ability to pour soldiers in to counter-attack, which could, in the worst case scenario, end up with the enemy reaching the underground tunnel and possibly even push through it and into your lines which could be quite the disaster. More often than not, a couple of squads will be sent out to grab nearby enemies and drag them back for interrogation. Maybe they could be used to raid a portion of the defensive line or in conjunction with a larger above ground assault to see strategic bunkers, heavy weapons emplacements and etc. But on Vrax, there was an attempt at a large scale underground offensive. This used not just tunnels, but vast digging machines known as Hades Breaching Drills. These 
gnarly looking machines are capable of digging very large and fairly wide tunnels very quickly using a melter cutter mounted in the middle center and large diamantine tipped grinding wheels. It can push through rock, dirt, mud, and damn near anything else at speed whilst creating a large tunnel. Of course, the tunnel will need to be continuously reinforced as the drill goes along, so you can't simply just zip through the ground with this thing. It will collapse awfully quickly behind it, but compared to digging with shovels and pickaxes, it is much much quicker and creates a much much larger route capable of pouring entire squads into the enemy defenses at speed. The aim with this underground offensive was to break in to the huge underground armories stored beneath the surface of Vrax, allowing the Death Corps to deny the enemy access to reinforcements via armored vehicles, guns, APCs, etc., and also potentially to seize access to the lifts, which would transport all of the equipment up onto the surface, opening up a potential mass ingress route in the middle of the enemy's defenses. Now, I shan't be so mean as to spoil how that worked out, because you gotta go watch the series, but this is absolutely a strategy that the engineers can use for large-scale maneuvers. A dozen of these things could potentially create a dozen large tunnels through which thousands of Death Corps troops could be moved, possibly even using smaller and lighter APCs. Of course, stealth is not an option whilst using these things, and so each Hades breaching drill will have to be heavily protected by possibly dozens of smaller saps and tunnels, making sure that the enemy can't break directly into the Hades tunnel and destroy hours, days, weeks, and months worth of work. It is a major undertaking, but the ability to potentially collapse a massive segment of the enemy's front lines, either through a mine or a large-scale incursion, should never be underestimated. Especially when led by the engineers who made the holes to begin with. The Mark 22 might not be the best above-ground weapon, sure, but... Trench fighting is not so different from tunnel fighting, and carrying loads of frag and crack grenades in addition to demo chargers can make awfully short work of most reinforced bunkers. Maybe you could add in some of the more esoteric weapons in the Death Court arsenal as well, like for example, gas. Now there's another fascinating way to counter mine as well. Why break into an enemy tunnel when you can make a small hole in the wall via a drill, for example, put in a little tube and then start pumping poisonous gas into it? If you can pump enough poison gas into it, you'll make it damn near impossible for the enemy to operate their tunnel until they come down with breathing equipment, at which point you will have had all the time in the world to plant plenty of demolition charges to make their entrance all the more celebratory and loud, of course, since the Death Corps is equipped and accustomed to operating in deathly conditions at all times, trained as they are on the poisonous swamps of Krieg and the irradiated wastelands outside of their underground shelters. In almost all circumstances, they will be far more accustomed to these ordeals than almost any enemy ever would. One of the reasons why the Vraxians gave them so much trouble was that they too had spent decades, centuries, digging out vast underground spaces, often with less than ideal life support equipment. 
And with all that being said, I will wrap up this lore video. I hope you've enjoyed it, and of course the custom art is, again, from the Siege of Rack series, and a happier time when fans of 40k were allowed to create fan content, rather than today when GW will threaten you with lawsuit over that sort of things. Oh, the good times. Until next time, I have been Arch. Thank you all very much for listening, and I hope to see you all again soon. Till then, have a good day.